Like you don't have to change the world. Yeah. You just have to do your very best to change the world around you and, mm-hmm. and, and the people you actually interact with. It's really just helping the person right next to you, I think is, is, is enough. I'm here at the Lafitte Greenway, a formerly abandoned railroad corridor turned public green space serving people here in New Orleans. How can you serve your community while also serving the planet and creating spaces like this? Today I'm talking with Melody Arcia, who's the communications coordinator at Seoul, Saving Our Urban Landscape, focused on not only fighting for the future that she wants, but for the future that neighbors here in New Orleans need. Who are you? Uh, my name is Melody Arcia, and I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. So I'm the communications coordinator at Sustaining Our Urban Landscape, or SOL. We're an environmental nonprofit here in New Orleans, and we plant trees in different areas of the city, and typically the neighborhoods that are the most environmentally vulnerable. So whether it's stormwater management, reducing street flooding, lowering the air temperatures, reducing uh, pollution, all those things kind of are the benefits of, of the program that we do. I feel like my life has basically been a long journey of uh, pursuing social justice and helping out people whenever I can. So actually both my parents work in social services and so for my dad was a pastor and he also worked with youth and young adults who were unhoused and he also worked as a victim advocate for the police department. And my mom worked with women and children who um, were low income as well. So I feel like, you know, helping people is in my blood is, is what I've kind of seen my whole life. What did you want to be growing up? You know, doctor, veterinarian, firefighter. But it wasn't probably until later on, maybe like my senior year of high school, where I really turned to humanitarian work. I thought I would probably wanted to work for the Red Cross, you know, travel, do humanitarian work overseas. Um, but it really wasn't until I got to college that I got a firm grasp of what my role could potentially be in helping people. So I remember sitting in my intro sociology class, and we had this book we were reading called Lies My Teacher Told Me. But it goes into how history has basically been told through one lens, which is that of you know the white male, wealthy white men. and basically silence the voices of black and brown people. It's really been this singular story that's been presented as a singular truth. And so that kind of blew my mind like wide open. Like it really shook my worldview of learning that there's so many, there's such a, a wider truth out there to discover. So once that kind of cracked open, I, I really started pursuing studying social justice and global justice. So I got my bachelor's and my master's in social work with a focus in social justice because I was just like so curious about this. So I, I definitely always did really well in school. So I was kind of like a little know-it-all. <laughs> I was constantly sharing my opinions. My, my family's like, yeah, you're, you're gonna be a doctor because you seem to know everything. But as far as hobbies go, like when I was growing up, I was very much into music. I played like about three or four different instruments um, for, for a very, very long time. And my dad was a musician too. That's so funny, I never thought about that. <laughs> Yeah, my like, dad played piano like his entire life. Mm-hmm. I played in orchestra and band and marching band. I was really able to express myself that way. I love being a part of a larger sound. You make up this beautiful song by year of one instrument. So it was really meaningful to me. And I love to write too. I love to write short stories. Do you still have that connection with music? I, th- I think now I really try to listen to a lot of gospel music. Uh-huh. So I explained my dad was a pastor. I yeah. grew up in church and it just helps me like find hope and inspiration to get through the day. So, you know, losing my dad a couple years ago, it was hard. And so connecting with the music that he listened to and that I listened to growing up, I think it just brings something together inside for me. Like it gives me hope, peace, a sense of connection to him still. He, he grew up, he didn't know his dad. And I think he just really, um, took it upon himself to really change that story for his legacy and his family. So he, he put all his all into being a great father. He left a legacy of love and helping people. Um, and I just tried to, you know, 
walk in, in that role as well yeah. to follow to follow his lead and, and to keep his legacy going forward. So I lost my dad in um, March 2017. He passed away, but he would like give so much of himself, not only to me and to the family, but he would like just give so much of himself to everyone else. Mm, yeah. The thing yeah. that's like interesting to me is that when my dad passed, like he was really like my best friend in the world, my biggest source of motivation. Mm -hmm. And but still is my biggest source of motivation, yeah. which I think is beautiful. And it's hard because it's been like last year was five years, just like the loss and the gap is still there, but also he gave me so many amazing tools. And it sounded like your dad gave you so many amazing tools that you can kind of go forward with. Really, like when you dedicate yourself to loving and helping others you know the change like basically climate change for example it's such a huge problem you know and i think you can find satisfaction in even if your work your role is is minor in the grand scheme of things that you can find satisfaction and joy in your small role like you don't have to change the world yeah. you just have to do your very best to change the world around you and, and, and the people you actually interact with. So, you know, instead of taking the whole world on your shoulders, really just helping the person right next to you, I think is, is, is enough. In terms of like helping the person mm -hmm. right next to you and that, doing what you can, mm -hmm. doing your part maybe, mm -hmm. like is there anything you're most proud of? I feel like, you know, as the communications coordinator, yeah. I get to share people's stories. Mm -hmm. And I feel most proud when I'm talking to, you know, a, a resident or a community member and they're sharing their story of how their neighborhood looks completely different today than it did when they were a child. Yeah. How like the tree lined streets they grew up with are just a memory now. And they're so overjoyed that, you know, we're bringing the trees back to the neighborhood. Could you, could you tell me more about the work that you do? Yeah, so when you plant trees strategically in clusters, in close proximity, they begin to work together as a form of green infrastructure. For example, our state tree, the bald cypress, when it's mature, it can drink 880 gallons of water in one day. Wow. That's fantastic. And so just imagine a street lined with bald cypress and oaks and maples. When you have a neighborhood that has a plethora of trees, then you start to see that neighborhood respond to storms differently. Just thinking about neighborhoods that were historically redlined and segregated. Those are actually our hottest neighborhoods in the nation today. Heat is the number one weather-related cause of death in the U.S. There's a certain group of people who are more prone to this very big risk. And so when you line a street with trees and you shade that street, you can actually lower the temperature of that block by an average of about 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a climate solution, but it's also a life-saving component too. When you um, want people to be to care about climate change, you can't lose the people and, and focus on saving the environment. If you, lose, if you lose the people piece, then you've lost pretty much the whole the whole reason why we're trying to do all this good work. So, I think for me, like I always knew I wanted to help people, but I didn't know what role that would take. When I took this job, I knew basically not very much about climate change or climate solutions, but I knew that these solutions, this work actually impacts people tremendously, like in their everyday lives. And I think too, you, we have to avoid being like an outsider coming to someone's community. I think, you know, community forestry, urban forestry is most successful when we engage people who live there and we and we come alongside them and partner with them to get this work done. If you had a magic wand, mm -hmm. what kind of difference would you hope to make? So like I said when I was younger, my vision was to change the world, but where I am right now in this season of life is really just being my most authentic, genuine self and showing up for the people around me. Just being present and connecting with them is my is my primary goal. And so just finding strength like in my face, um, with my family, it, it really gives me like an inner strength like to press on. And, and I really, I feel like my joy is genuine. I don't have to fake it. it it's something that comes from within, you know? Yeah. You don't have to do life alone. You know, I feel like when you find, yeah. when you try and really connect with people and join together, 
you you don't have to carry the weight on your own. That incidentally changes the world. Mm -hmm. Like when people see you being able to show up authentically as yourself, mm -hmm. that gives other people permission to do that. People change the world all the time without trying. Mm -hmm. um, and it might even just be a simple interaction. Like, mm -hmm. Is there any advice you have for your younger self? I think just be gentle with yourself. Be patient on your journey. And no step or turn is a, is a mistake. It, it'll all kind of lead you to where you're ultimately um, supposed to end up. You know, it's important to be flexible. So like when you have a dream as a kid, those dreams are, are great, they're fantastic, they're what motivates us to pursue things. But when you hold too tightly for how that dream is supposed to look, then you, you'll you have more like mental anguish and anxiety um, and you'll miss out on so many more amazing opportunities. So for me, when I was young, I knew I wanted to help people. I didn't know that I would be planting trees. You know, I pursued social work by 20, what, two, 23. I was kind of a burnt out social worker. And I took a little detour, I call it a hiatus from social work. And I actually went to hairstyling. I was a hairstylist for a couple years. So I would say really there's no mistakes, there's no wrong turns in life. You know, just, you know, be patient, be gentle with yourself and, you know, just take the next yes, the next turn, and, and you'll end up ultimately where, you know, you can find some satisfaction and joy in your, in your career and your role. But just pivoting, you know, like if, if your first dream or vision is not, didn't work out, then just pivot and continue on the path. My name is Melody Arcia, and I'm the Communications Coordinator at Sustaining Our Urban Landscape, and I'm helping the world reach drawdown by planting trees in New Orleans.